Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. And good morning, Mom. Uh, Thank you for that, because I was hollering at you when you just went off a minute ago. (laughs) I know, that's why I said that. All righty, let's let's begin class with prayer, everyone. Gracious uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and the truth you've revealed to us in the special time in which we live in Earth's history. We just long to fulfill the calling you have for your people to to not only know you personally, but be effective in sharing a message that can reach other hearts and minds of people who so desperately need your love, your grace, your peace, your transforming power in their lives. We pray you will be with us today as we study that we will be able to uh, discern more deeply the truths you have for us and and be transformed and be more effective in sharing with others that we might see you face to face very soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen. 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 So we are doing lesson number two in the quarterly, The Great Controversy, and the title of the lesson today is The Central Issue, Love Versus Selfishness. And I thought, what a great title, because this is the central issue in the war, love versus selfishness. And as you think about that, what is the primary driver, the primary emotional driver to selfishness? Fear. Fear. That's right. It's fear. Fear of all kinds. Fear drives us to be self-reflective, self-protective, survival of the fittest. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they ran and hid because they were afraid. And because of God's love and grace after Adam and Eve sinned, God did not abandon humanity to this terminal fear selfishness, sin condition, but immediately there in Eden, God began intercession. He began intervening in the natural result of what sin does inside people. God said right there in Genesis 3.15 that he would cause enmity between the serpent and the woman, that he would begin intervening to put a conviction in our heart for something better, a longing, a wooing. We are not satisfied with the ways of fear, sin, and selfishness. We we want love, we want wholeness, we want healing. There's a, that desire for something better is not natural to the sinful heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in us, causing a, a division, if you will, between the natural rebellious heart and what uh, and, and God's kingdom. And then we respond to one of the two now because of God's grace intervening in that process. So the point is we cannot overcome the spirit of fear within our own hearts, the spirit of fear that we inherited from Adam uh, on our own, with our own power and strength. It requires the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, to bring us to conviction. And then as we choose, we receive a new heart and right spirit with new desires and new motives that come from God. And as we respond to that, then we grow and mature. But that is the work of the Holy Spirit, empowering, enlightening, convicting, and then empowering us as we choose to say no to the fear and selfishness and yes to the love and trust. If you'd like to read more about this process in detail, it's our two-part blog series that's up right now, Salvation and the Cleansing of Our Spirits, Part 1, and How Jesus, Our Substitute, Cleanses Our Spirit, Part 2, which is on our website right now. Has anybody read them? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Does it make sense? Any questions about them? No. No. Good. All right. So um, Paul describes these two antagonistic principles in Romans 1, excuse me, Romans 8, 1 and 2. Uh, There is therefore now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There's the flesh drives, there the spirit drives. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is known as survival of the fittest. It's the fear-based, me-first, self-centered approach to life. But the law of the spirit of life, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, the neighbor is yourself. Greater love is no one that he give his life for a friend. That's antagonistic to the law of sin and death. These are the two principles at war in every heart. Does that make sense to everyone? So we, with the new heart and right spirit, we live according to the spirit, which is the spirit of love and trust, and that is the spirit of life. 
for God's laws are the design laws of truth, love, and freedom. And once we are restored to harmony with these design laws in heart, in spirit, in attitude, in motive, in desire, we make choices to live in harmony with them and we're no longer controlled by the spirit of fear and selfishness anymore. We live different lives. Thus Paul says later in Romans 14, whatever is not of faith is sin. Whatever comes from the spirit of fear and selfishness, which breaks trust with God, that's what sin is. We're breaking trust. We're acting on our own. We're not, we don't, we're not acting on love and faith and confidence in our Savior anymore. And this is the war going on in every heart and mind. Do we love and trust Jesus so much that we surrender to him, die to the old fear and me first ways, and receive through faith a new spirit of love and trust, so that instead of clinging to fear, we we actually choose to live lives of love? Or do we cling to the fear and selfishness and create philosophies that justify the fear and selfishness as righteous? And those philosophies, the common ones in the world today are godless evolution. Godless evolution is a philosophy. There's no God and, and survival of the fittest is adaptive. It's what helps us evolve. It helps us advance. We're better off because of it. it justifies the fear and selfishness or all forms of paganism. All forms of paganism also uh, justify the fear and selfishness or legalism, Christian legalism, as Paul deals with in Romans that the Jews had fallen into. And he talks about the faith of law versus the, or the righteousness that comes from law, which is a fraud versus the righteousness which comes from faith or trust. And he contrasts that through the whole book of Romans. And when you have the the human law lens, then you have the righteousness of law keeping versus the design law lens. You have the righteousness of love and trust as the spirit gives us a new heart, and right spirit. Questions about any of that? Mm -hmm. So the lesson points now to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and Jesus prophecy before his crucifixion, which blends the destruction of Jerusalem with the events prior to his second coming. And then the lesson says the following. In the destruction of Jerusalem, we discover a foreshadowing of Satan's strategy, both to deceive and destroy God's people at the end of time. Uh, Jesus' instruction in Matthew 24 clearly outlines last day events in the context of Jerusalem's fall. And, and I think there are very important lessons for us to learn uh, in the great controversy from the events that, uh, uh, that happened in Jerusalem to understand events that are happening in the world around us today. And I wanna unpack those with you. In the book, The Great Controversy, if you read that book, do you know what the first chapter is in that book, which is the fifth book in the compilation? The first chapter is the destruction of Jerusalem. That's where, 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 where she opens that book. Uh, and I'm gonna share with you some sections from the 1880 version of that book that came out in 1888, the year of the great divide in the Adventist church, when the official leadership rejected the advancing light of God's law being design law, and instead held on to the imperial Roman view of law, the Romanization of the church that God's law functions like human law, and therefore sin is a legal problem, just like the Jews did with their interpretation of law. And you look at that contrast constantly, why they were angry at Jesus, because he kept breaking the law and if, uh, and if we don't reject the Romanization of Christianity and, and if we don't return to worshiping God as creator whose laws are the design laws, then what you're gonna see in these paragraphs are that we're gonna actually recapitulate or fulfill the same fate, the same result, the same outcome the Jews who rejected Jesus experienced in their destruction at Jerusalem. And, and just remember those Jews who experienced the destruction of Jerusalem and all the things you're gonna hear in this few paragraphs we're gonna read, they were faithful Sabbath keepers. Get your mind around that because many in our church today believe we're, that they're safe as long as they're keeping the Sabbath, that the keep, Sabbath keeping makes them safe. Sabbath keeping does not make anyone safe. Okay? I'm not, I'm not in any way throwing Sabbath keeping under the bus. I'm not in any way suggesting Sabbath keeping is bad or wrong. I'm suggesting you cannot be kept safe by observing a day of the week. 
You have to. The only safety is in having a heart renewed to be like Jesus, to live out his principles. So now consider this statement, and I'm going to start with this particular statement and paragraph because it is an act, it's actually an ambiguous statement. What I mean by ambiguous is that it leaves open to be interpreted in a variety of ways what, what is being said. And those who cling within the Adventist church to the imposed law system, the human law system, will take statements just like this one and interpret it through their in, uh, human law system and use it to try and advance that falsehood. But that's why I'm starting with this one, because after she makes this statement, she goes on to describe exactly in her view what these words mean. And, and you will only get her understanding of these words if you keep reading. If you just pluck this up out and then throw it in people's faces, you will almost always get them to think in the human law model, which is exactly the opposite of what she's teaching. So let's, uh, let's look at this, uh, let, let, let's look at these in detail. Here's the first paragraph that I'll share with you. Jesus declared to the listening disciples the judgments that were about to fall upon apostate Israel, and especially the retributive vengeance that would come upon them for their rejection of the and crucifixion of the Messiah. Unmistakable signs would precede the awful climax. The dreaded hour would come suddenly and swiftly, and the Savior warned his followers, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning sign should be seen, those who would escape must make no delay. Now, I start with this paragraph. Can you see how the words in this paragraph could, are ambiguous? <laughs> what I mean by ambiguous, words like judgments, mm -hmm. retributive vengeance. Mm -hmm. are, are those very plain and clear to you or could they have more than one meaning? Mm -hmm. yes. more than one. <clears throat> but what's it lend your mind to think typically? God. These are the types of words that are used by the penal legalists, those who rejected the 1888 message in our leadership to teach the lie that, that God uses his power to inflict punishment. They do so because, and I don't, I don't think they do so out of maliciousness, I think they have sincere hearts like Saul of Tarsus prior to Damascus Road was sincerely seeking to advance what he believed was the true Bible message. And what was he doing? He was persecuting Christ in the church, but he wasn't doing it because he was wanting to harm. He was doing it. He was wanting to protect what he faithfully thought was right. This is what's happening in the Adventist church. There's a group of people who faithfully think this is the right thing and they're faithfully trying to protect it. The problem is just like Saul of Tarsus, they believe one single core lie, God's law works like human law. And if God's law works like human law, then righteousness and justice is the enforcement of the law. And, and if you don't enforce it, then, you're, then you just let chaos come. And thus they teach that God is the one who uses, and they will take paragraphs like this, his judgments, he's judged them to be wrong for rejecting Christ, and he will use his power to bring retributive vengeance upon them. That's what, what God looks like. That's how he rules. Well, I want you to see what this author describes as God's judgments and retributive justice. And, and we're going to, as we go through this, slowly, we're going to be asking the question, what kind of laws is actually being described here? And so continuing the very same paragraph as this author unpacks what she just said, notice what, what, what we see here. The Jews had forged their own fetters. They had fi filled for themselves the cup of vengeance. Right. What kind of law is described here, just in this one sentence? Perhaps it's not fully clear yet, but doing something to oneself is different than an outside authority doing it to you, isn't it? Yes. Right. So, true. so we're already leaning in the direction here. You might say, yeah, but they did it to themselves because they knew the rules and they broke the rules. <laughs> All righty, okay. Maybe if you really want to bend it that way. So let's see what the author continues to say. 
in the utter destruction that befell them as a nation, and in all the woes that followed them in the dispersion, they were but reaping the harvest which their own hands had sown. What kind of law is sowing and reaping? That's exactly right. It, it, reaping the punishment that comes as a natural result of breaking the laws of health is not an infliction by an external authority. They reap what they themselves have sown. This is this is describing health. There's not Galatians 6, uh, those who sowed to the carnal nature, from that nature reap destruction, Galatians 6, 8. This should be enough. These two sentences should be enough to interpret the author's meaning of retributive justice that God lets people go to reap what they have chosen and violating God's design laws results in ruin and death. But the author doesn't leave it with this. Notice what the author writes next. Says the prophet, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. The sufferings are often, their sufferings are often rep represented as a punishment visited upon them by the direct decree of God. Pause, we're pausing again. Who, who, by, by whom? Who would do such a thing as suggesting the punishments uh, upon Israel, what they reaped in their destruction and dispersion? Who would suggest that God was doing this to them? Satan. Oh, so so only Satan. Yes, yeah, Satan certainly is. Is just Satan? Just a fallen angel does that? No. no. Or by all those Christians who believe God's law functions like human law. Martin Luther, the great reformer, took this punishing God view, and the legalists within our own church who cling to the idea that God's law functions like human law do the very same thing. Teach that God in justice must use his power to punish. And they use examples like this through history all the time. They use the flood, they use Sodom and Gomorrah, they use all kinds of places as if God is punishing. But note that the author says, what the author says is the source. Continuing next sentence. It is thus that the great deceiver seeks to conceal his own work. So true. So, so according to this author who wrote the book Great Controversy, yeah. who is the one who brings pain, suffering, and death? Satan. That's who this author says. And who does the Bible say holds the power of death in Hebrews 2.14? Satan and Christ came to destroy him, holds the power of death, that is the devil, says in Hebrews 2.14. And who does the Bible say is the murderer from the beginning? Satan. Satan. And who destroys death and brings life and immortality to light? Jesus. 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 And, 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 and uh, 2 Timothy 1.10. And <clears throat> so understand this. The Bible is very clear. Satan is the murderer from the beginning. He holds the power of death. Christ came to destroy him and holds the power of death. Christ destroys death. Christ holds the keys to the grave. Okay, so we have uh, two contrasting powers, one who brings and, and causes death, one who destroys death and brings life. Yet, Satan conceals himself in a system of theology in which people teach that God is the source of death inflicted upon people as punishment for sin. This is the great deceiver hiding himself, continuing on. By stubborn rejection of divine love and mercy, the Jews had caused the protection of God to be withdrawn from them, and Satan was permitted to rule them according to his will. Oh, Notice, God uses power. He uses power to create, to heal, to protect, to discipline, uh, to hold and restrain. But when we reject God, we separate ourselves from his life-giving presence and place ourselves under the power of God's enemy, the father of lies, the one who holds the actual power of death. Continuing on with the quote, the horrible cruelties enacted in the destruction of Jerusalem are a demonstration of Satan's vindictive power over those who yield to his control. We cannot know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. It is the restraining power, there's God's power, the restraining power of God that prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. Wow. This is how God uses power, to protect, to heal, to redeem, to restore, to restrain, to build up, not to tear down, not to destroy. Satan is the destroyer, Jesus is the restorer. Amen. How God must weep 
when the people who call are called by his name promote a false god with the attributes of his enemy. And this is why the Adventist church is stuck, because in 1888, when this message came forward, the official leadership rejected it, clung to imposed law constructs, and continues to teach through official documents and stuff that God in justice must use his power to kill the wicked. And ultimately, many teach that God killed Jesus in our place. Continuing on with the quote. The disobedient and unthankful have great reason for the gratitude for God's mercy and long suffering in holding in check the cruel, malignant power of the evil one. But when men pass limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. Now get this. God does not stand towards the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against transgression, but he leaves the rejecters of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. Amen. What law is being described? God is not the executioner. Yet in 27 Fundamental Beliefs, page 111, it states that God is the executioner, that justice requires that God execute justice on sin and thus the sinner. In this execution, the Son of God took man's place according to God's will. That's what it states in that book. It's a lie. God did not execute his son. That's what you get when you substitute God's law with man's law and teach a Romanization of Christianity that God is the source of inflicted pain, suffering, and death. So God does not stand towards as an executioner. That's what the, in Satan's kingdom, when laws are nothing but made up rules, that's what you have to do. But in God's kingdom, breaking his design laws results in ruin and death, separates you from the source of life, and will result in death unless the creator intervenes, intercedes to heal, restore, or fix, and put us back in harmony, writes his law in our hearts and minds. But God can only do that with our consent, with our agreement, with our active and purposeful cooperation. Because if, because it is the only way God can save our unique personhood and individuality. If God were to use his divine power to override our free will choices, he would erase us, replace our individuality, our identity with a programmed simulation of a person, a robot, a computer but it would not be us. Thus God seeks to win us by the methods of his spirit, not by might, nor by power, but by the way the spirit works, the spirit of truth and love, to freely win us to surrender to him and cooperate with him for the healing of our hearts and minds. But if we refuse him, if we harden ourselves against him and destroy the faculties that can respond to truth and love, he in the end sadly lets us go to reap what we have chosen and we suffer and die from sin, not as an inflicted punishment from God. But God's enemy has infected the church, the temple of God, with the lie that God's law functions like human law, and it is taught from the pulpits around the world that God's justice is the infliction of punishment for sin. What a horrible demonic deception. Continuing on with the quote. Every ray of light rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The spirit of God persistently resisted is at last withdrawn from the sinner, and then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. Again, do you see how this author keeps emphasizing that God is not the destroyer. The punishment does not come from God, that the punishment is the natural result of sin, just as the Bible teaches. Do you see how this is emphasized again and again by this author? Yet almost all of Christianity has accepted the Romanization of Christianity, that God's law functions like human law and teaches God is the source of inflicted torture and death. We have a message for this time in human history to lighten the world and prepare for Christ's return, that is to call people back to worshiping God as creator, which requires them to reject the imposed Roman law construct and see all of God's laws as design laws. Continuing on with the quote. 
The destruction of Jerusalem is a fearful and solemn warning to all who are trifling with the offers of divine grace and resisting the pleadings of divine mercy. Never was there given a more decisive testimony to God's hatred of sin and to the certain punishment that will fall upon the guilty. Where's the punishment going to come from? The Savior's prophecy concerning the visitation of judgments upon Jerusalem is to have another fulfillment of which that terrible desolation was a faint shadow. What kind of judgments fell that we just read about fell on Jerusalem? Were they arbitrary decrees? Were they judicial legal enactments? Or were they the diagnostic judgments of what actually is? What God says in Hosea 11:7, my people are bent on turning away from me. Let them go. God diagnoses them as hardened in rebellion. What more can he do? So he lets them go to reap what they have chosen. He places them in the hands of the God they prefer. And, and notice this author is saying this type of judgment is a foreshadow of what's about to come on the world. Continuing with the quote, in the fate of, that, of the chosen city, we may behold the doom of a world that has rejected God's mercy and trampled upon his law. And this is the entire world of the unsaved. Those who claim there is no God, and those who claim to believe in God, but like the Jews 2,000 years ago, remember, this is the, again, the lesson from Jerusalem. And the people being destroyed in Jerusalem were not godless atheists. They were Bible-believing, God-fearing, Sabbath-keeping Adventists of their day who rejected the truth of God's design law and worshiped God as a Roman dictator, even though they denied Rome, that the metaphor still stands. They preferred a God who is like Satan in character, one who is powerful. They wanted a God to use power to punish the Romans, a God who makes up rules. That's, that's who they were worshiping. Continuing on with the quote, dark are the records of human misery that earth has witnessed during the long centuries of crime. The heart sickens and the mind grows faint in contemplation. Terrible have been the results of rejecting the authority of heaven. But a scene yet darker is presented in the revelation of the future. The records of the past, the long procession of tumults, conflicts and revolutions, the battle of the warrior, the confused noise, the garments roiled in blood, what are these in contrast with the terrors of the day when the restraining spirit of God shall be wholly withdrawn from the wicked, no longer to hold in check the outburst of human passion and satanic wrath? The world will then behold as never before the results of Satan's rule. What, what happens when God removes his restraining hand? Are you starting to see this happening in the world right now before us? Yes. And why is the spirit withdrawn? Has God got a clock and the clock is approaching midnight and, and uh, it's, it's Ali Ali in free, ready or not, here I come? People reject God, hardened. That's exactly right. People reject. Where is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit on earth? Hearts. hearts and minds of people, the spirit temple. So what happens when billions harden their heart against the Holy Spirit? The spirit does not force his way. The spirit slowly withdraws as we close him out. This is not an arbitrary decision on God's part. It is the natural result of people preferring Satan and his methods to those of God's. So with all that, what is God's retributive vengeance that we read in the original paragraph. God letting go people to reap what they've chosen. It is when God stops using divine power to hold at bay what Satan and sinners do. Is this how you've always been taught and, and presented what God's retributive justice is? No. 
Now let's consider that same paragraph again with the explanation of the author. Keep what we just read in mind, that the author explained the meaning of these words. Let's look at that paragraph again. Jesus declared to his listening disciples the judgments that were to fall upon apostate Israel, and especially the retributive vengeance that would come upon them for their rejection and crucifixion of the Messiah. Unmistakable signs would precede the awful climax. The dreaded hour would come suddenly and swiftly, and the Savior warned his followers, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet, stand in the holy place, who reads, let, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in holy ground, which extends some furlongs outside the city, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning signs should be seen, those who would escape must make no delay. And this she applied in a bigger sense to the world's coming to, world events coming right now. So question, what is the abomination that causes desolation? <clears throat> Putting Satan in your heart instead of God. Oh, I love all, all well, everyone, I, I agree with that. The abomination of a false God with a false law and a false standard, the Roman standard of righteousness and the roman standard of righteousness is law and punishment that's the roman standard and when we put that standard when it's that standard we see it on holy ground we know the warning has been given and have we seen that standard recently on holy ground well i'm going to suggest we have and that was during COVID. we saw the false standard of made up rules and human laws imposed upon people to coerce consciences standing on the holy ground of church institutions in the holy place of human hearts and minds when leaders of churches embrace the lie that it is righteous to coerce the conscience of their own members, employees, and students in a worldwide lockdown and assault against the truth and, and, and love all under the guise of doing what is right and just. It is an abomination of truth, an abomination of righteousness, an abomination of love, and billions, billions embraced it as right and just. And sadly, within the church, this method of governing, this type of law has replaced God's design law, and it is taught that God's justice is God using power to inflict pain, suffering, and destruction. So in my view, we have seen the armies of the world join forces with the church to coerce consciences in a worldwide lockdown, just like the armies circled Jerusalem in AD 70. And now, just like then, we have a brief period where the armies have pulled back. And there's this brief moment where we feel freedom again. And it's time for us to not delay. If you want to escape, you must flee. But the fleeing that we do is not geographic. Our fleeing is to flee spiritually from our heart's loyalties and devotion to those who practice beastly methods and make our heart's loyalties and devotion to Jesus Christ and the God of heaven and his system and methods alone. That's what we must do. We must come out of Babylon. And, and remember, the, remember the second angel's message and, and the message of the angel Revelation 18? Come out of her, my people. God's people have been caught up, just like the Jews were caught up in Babylon and they were captives and they were called to leave Babylon and go back and be repairers of the breach. We are called to flee this system of imperial law and repair the breach in the law. And the breach in the law is the breach of the, of, of the design laws with the idea that God's law is an imposed law that is changeable, and the evidence that we have been breached is that we is that the church has changed one of the laws. That's the evidence of the breach. The breach is not the change of the, of the Sabbath. The breach is the idea that God's law is human law, which led to the change of the Sabbath. You said you said these quotes come from the Great Controversy of 1888. Is the current yep. book different? 
Uh, I'm not sure if it is or not. I just wanted to show that this was what was written in 1888. I think these paragraphs are probably the same. I wouldn't allege that they're different in this section, but I just wanted to show that this came out in 1888 at that time, okay. not after. That this message was what was coming forward for the church and it got rejected in 1888 by the leadership and they shipped her off to Australia. The last paragraph says, we will study Satan's twofold strategy, both to deceive and destroy God's people. What the evil one fails to accomplish through persecution, he hopes to achieve through compromise. God is never caught by surprise. And even in the most challenging times, he um, preserves his people. So Satan's strategy, in my view, is actually much more than a twofold strategy. It's a stepwise progression that he works through pretty much always the same. And I'm going to walk you through the stepwise um, progression of the devil. And you can see it in history and you can see how it's occurring now. Uh, Satan's number one or first step is deception. He's the father of lies. His first step is to lie and deceive. Satan lied to the angels in heaven. He lied to Eve in Eden. He approached Jesus initially as an angel of light, deceiving him, who, attempting to deceive in who he was and what he was saying. He is the father of lies and always seeks to deceive in some way. And this, he will, this will always be foundational. Do, do we all agree on that? Yes. Okay. But if straight out deception doesn't work, he adds in to further the deception inducements bribes, offers of something to make us supposedly more, a reward of some kind, a payoff in some way, typically appealing to our ego, to pride, to esteem, to power, to prestige, to position, something to introduce an uneasiness, to inflame the lie that uh, we can't trust God with our position, our calling, our, our, our mission, that we need to act in self-interest to advance ourselves. Some inducement is offered, uh, often accompanied by fear that if we don't act, we'll lose it. We better do it so, because we'll lose it if we don't. And, and you can see this. He offered Eve. Eve could become God, like God. You could advance your station, Eve. He offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. He offered Jesus a, a way to advance his station and, and get ahead. So you'll see that the lies are often accompanied by inducements, bribes, advancements, rewards, somehow suggesting we could do this and, and be better off than we currently are trusting God with our situation. And then the third are miracles. Uh, he, he deceived, he threw in inducements, and then Eve was presented with the miracle of a talking serpent. Uh, Jesus was miraculously transported to the temple. And then Jesus was tempted to Jesus was tempted to call upon God to perform a miracle to prove who he was. These miracles by Satan, the talking serpent transporting Jesus to the temple, these were not illusions. These were not pretend. They were real. And Satan can perform certain miracles and we'll do so again before Christ comes. And if we don't know the truth, if we aren't, if we don't rest in faith where God has called us to fulfill, and if we don't value truth over signs and wonders, we'll be very, very vulnerable to the deceptions. And then if the deceptions with the inducements and the miracles don't work, then come the threats. Jesus was threatened repeatedly by the Jews, at the instigation of Satan, was threatened with rejection, abandonment of friends, betrayal. His reputation was tarnished. He was called uh, a worshiper of Beelzebub, uh, eventually threatened with death by the Jews, threatened by Pilate before Pilate finally condemned him to death. So all kinds of threats came to try to intimidate. And then before death, physical assault, physical abuse, torment. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was uh, abused, he was mocked, he was teased, he was let, nailed to a cross. All of these, physical assault, death, abuse, these are acts of injustice. And we're gonna come to that in just a moment because the acts of injustice are a unique type of temptation. And then finally, if, if, if deception, inducement, miracles, threats, and, and unjust abuse does not get us to choose Satan's side, then Satan will, if God permits it, kill the righteous because he wants to remove them from the playing field and remove their influence. So what, when, 
Do you see this progression? Do you see these steps? Mm -hmm. We see it in the world okay. too. <laughs> Pardon? We see it in the world today. It is still ha very Hundred, clear. Yes, because because all the kingdoms of the world belong to who? Satan. Satan. Yeah, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. That's exactly right. So you will see all the kingdoms of the world doing this because they all run on Satan's system. Now, what is the goal of Satan's attack and strategy? Through all these steps, he's got a goal. What is his goal? What does he want to accomplish by doing this? Does he really, was, was his goal just to kill Adam and Eve? Was that his true goal? No. He wants to be worshipped. Right. He wants to be worshipped, which means he wants to displace God from our hearts and minds and set himself up in the spirit temple to be worshipped, which means he wants beings created in the image of God to be image bearers of the devil. Can you see that? So notice then now these strategies again, how they work. Let's take them. The deception. Lies believed break the circle of love and trust, result in fear and selfishness and the corrupting of character. Thus the law, the living law of God, the character of God is effaced and displaced and satanic character takes the place of righteous character when we believe lies and act on fear and selfishness. We become satanic in character, evil and corrupt. Accepting inducements to do wrong inflames selfishness, pride, arrogance, breaks trust with God, incites fear and, and, and selfishness, and again, corrupts character, makes us more in the satanic mold. Believing uh, miracles over truth and evidence that God has given surrenders the mind, leading to choices that break the circle of love and trust, again, inciting fear and selfishness, corrupting the character. Threats that are designed to incite fear undermine, and undermine trust lead to acting to protect self. And after all, isn't it right to act to protect self? Isn't self-defense right and just? You see, I mean, it feels so right to act to defend self, doesn't it? That's why Jesus said we should strike the other one on the cheek, not turn the other cheek. <laughs> no, notice how deeply it feels, uh, how right it is in every society to defend oneself, to lash out and attack. That is the right thing to do in the system of the world. But Jesus said, Jesus didn't do it. And that leads us straight into the, the one that is, is I think, going to be the big one that if that these other ones lead up to this one, and this is the one that's going to deceive, if possible, the elect. And it's being employed right now, and that is Satan gets those who are loyal to him to do real injustice, like the beating and abusing of Jesus, the innocent one. All of the mocking, beating, the trial is all un unfair, is all unjust. And that injustice was designed to tempt with a sense of outrage, how wrong this is. This is unjust, this is not right, this is not fair. For the purpose of tempting the righteous to reach out and use Satan's method of power over to make it right, to make it just, to punish the lawbreaker, to set things right through power and force. This is the temptation that we will face at the end when the injustice of the beastly system rises to do justice against all of this wicked, corrupt stuff happening in the world that we see. And understand that Satan's goal is not to get the people doing wicked because he already has them. Right. Satan's goal is to get the righteous. Mm -hmm. And so he wants to inspire them with a sense of outrage against wickedness so that you will be willing to join forces with the beastly powers that rise in the name of Jesus to do righteousness and justice. But the righteousness and justice of this system of power is that of law enforced through proper punishments, which is how sadly most of Christianity teaches God runs his government. And it interests me that Jesus, I mean, uh, the attacks against Jesus were promoted by the church leaders and they only took the, uh, or prompted the Romans to become involved as tools to accomplish That's right. their and, purpose. And then at the crucifixion, this is Jesus' overwhelming temptation, the injustice, the outrage, the abuse to the one who holds all power. John 13, he had all power at his disposal. Would he use the power to punish injustice, to put down wrongdoing, or would he 
forgive those, what would he do? And Satan was betting that he could act out so outrageously that he would force Jesus to use his methods to put a stop to it. And that's what I think is coming upon the world. So it's going to get crazier and crazier. And then people are going to reach for law and order and the use of the power of the state. And they're going to do things that are designed to somehow bring justice and righteousness. They're going to pass various laws that they are claiming are for the good of mankind. But they'll in some way coerce the consciences of people. Tim. Sunday's lesson, third paragraph, Tim. says... Tim. It is difficult to understand such an event as the destruction of Jerusalem in the light of God's loving character. History reveals that tens of thousands died as the Roman general Titus led his armies against the city. Jerusalem was devastated. Men, women, and children were slaughtered. Where was God when his people suffered so greatly? The answer is clear, but not easy to grasp fully. God's heart was broken. His eyes were filled with tears. For centuries, he reached out to his people but their rebellion against his loving kind uh, by their rebellion against his loving kindness they forfeited his divine protection god does not always intervene to limit the results of his people's choices he allows the natural consequences of rebellion to develop god did not cause the slaughter of the innocent children in the destruction of jerusalem the tragic death of the innocents was satan's act not god's this is so well said I am so happy. I want to applaud this for being in the lesson, in the quarterly. It demonstrates that there are those still in the organization who are advancing the true gospel and who have not rejected the design laws of God and who see God's character in this true light. We should be praying for people like this to have a stronger and stronger voice in the system, don't you think? Yes. Yes. Tim, Tim. Yes. It was about the other paragraph before you went on to this one. What... Okay, is it wrong for, like, when somebody does something wrong, what is the difference for, for they need to suffer the, the consequences and maybe go to jail for something that they did? So are the consequences so, for doing, are the consequences for breaking God's law going to jail? No, no, no. No, that's the consequence for breaking human law. That's not God's law. Okay, so the human laws, God permitted human governments to create laws to create civil order and and prevent absolute anarchy and the breakdown of any type of, of civilized society so that we can work together, so we can meet, so that we can we can buy this property and create a, a meeting space. Uh, so because without the civil order of the government, then somebody with, gun, with power and guns could come along and take everything that's ours and make us their slaves and so forth. So God permits civil, civil laws and civil governments to exist to create a sense of semblance of order. But these are all artificial. These are all made up rules. It's not how reality actually works. There is nothing in God's kingdom that says um, thou shalt uh, go 35 miles an hour uh, on a particular highway. Uh, it, it, those laws are based on the laws of physics and what people believe are safety and the and the breaking and cornering mechanisms and reflex times of people. There's a there's a design law elements behind them all, but they're just made up rules. And all the laws of society are, de- if they're healthy laws, are designed to create some sense of order amongst a group of people who are unrighteous, unholy, self-centered, fear-driven, exploitive, and willing to use power over others to get their way. And so the governments are designed to restrain the absolute abuse of each other that would happen um, if uh, if they weren't there. Uh, so when you again say, should we not hold people accountable? Should there not be consequence? Well, it depends again, which law system are you talking about? In God's kingdom, even if the, and this is the reason many people in my patients struggle to, to actually forgive perpetrators who raped them, molest them, exploited them, because in our legal justice system of the human government, their perpetrator, their abuser never got held accountable. They were never arrested. They were never prosecuted. They were sent to jail. And so the victims that see me are still holding on to anger and resentment. I'm not going to let them get away with it. I'm going to make them, I'm going to, nobody else might, but I will still hold them accountable. Okay. Well, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of sin. They think that the sin problem is a legal problem and somebody has to actually punish them. It is not. The, the, 
Uh, so I, I give them this example and I ask the question, in your mind, at, at the proper time in the proper space, you can't open with this, okay? It takes a certain journey to get to be able to even hear this question. But in your mind, who do you think got damaged worse when your uncle molested you? You or your uncle? They always say, well, I did. I said, okay, let's take that at face value. Let's say now God takes you to heaven and he has a conversation with you right this moment. He says, I'm going to give you one choice between two options. First option is I'm going to send you back to earth and you're going to pick your life up exactly where I just took you from. There are no changes. You just continue your, your very same life. The second option is I, if you want it, I will let you trade lives with your uncle and you'll go around molesting kids, but no one will molest you. Whose life do you choose? 100% of my patients choose their own life. I go, why? If you, if, he got if you got damage worse than him, why wouldn't you take the one that has less damage? And then they realize, you know, when someone mistreats you, you can be hurt physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, but your soul remains clear. Your conscience remains clear. But when you exploit another person, you sear your conscience, warp your character, harden your heart, corrupt your soul. No one ever gets away with it. Sin, as we read in those paragraphs earlier, sin changes the sinner. It always does. And so no one gets away. And so that's the reality of God's kingdom. That's why God said, Jesus said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. They think they're killing me. They're destroying their own soul. All right. So I understand you to say then that it's not that the injustice that we're seeing nowadays with little kids, um, it's not that we want them to be held accountable. It's, it's when we go into action of legislating that um, to no the righteous use of power is to restrain evil it is righteous to restrain people who are harming the problem is it's going to go beyond restraint to the infliction of punishments for the purpose of advancing a new moral mor morality upon society I see it happening. okay tim i have i have a uh and it, something to introduce here that is of interest out of the reading of, of Isaiah. Um, God says clearly, I create light and I create darkness. Now, in some parts of the world, that's going to be taken as a yin and a yang. There's, you, you can't have the good without the evil and, and that sort of thing. I'm not going there. <laughs> what I am, Where I am going is that To understand that statement and that that um, representation that God makes of Himself, you have to understand that how He how He actually can create darkness in a person, and to do that, He would have to withdraw His Spirit, His the energy of His light, of His truth, and so it kind of goes back to another way of saying what you've already been saying this morning, but it's also, for me, another dimension of the, of the idea that none of this surprises God, none of this is out of His control, if you will, um, within the limits of how He's, he's conducting this, this experiment or this uh, theatrical play for the whole universe to see and to play out. So the, the Isaiah text that you quoted is A45.7. Go to our website and read our blog. It's actually mistranslated, um, I form light and I create the darkness. Uh, the accurate translation is I, I form the light and I tear down and destroy darkness. Okay. That's actually the accurate translation. So, so this verse that you quoted that many uh, uh, latch onto as God's the source of darkness is actually a mistranslation of, of what, wow. what's going on there. So, all right. Um, so bottom pink section, reflect on the following statement. We do not judge God's character by events we see around us. Rather, we filter all the events we see through the prism of his loving character as revealed in the Bible. Why is, such, why is this such good counsel? You know, I wanna say, I think this is a great idea. A good, it's a good process. But what's the problem with the process? There's a problem with it. What's the problem? 
What, what if you're fil inter what if you are filtering world events through the lens of God's character and you view God's character in the same light as a Roman Caesar? He makes up rules and justice is inflicting rules and he must punish rule breakers. And then you interpret things through that light. Does that actually help you? No. no that's a so this assumes one actually has the right view of God's character. But we've already established that the great majority, I mean, you go back and look at Christ's day. When he's dealing with religious leaders of the church that God formed, who had the oracles of God and who were the Advent movement with the right Sabbath, the diet message, the health message, all this stuff, uh, they 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 did not disagree with Jesus on the Sabbath, on the dress code, on the food choices, on the tithe system, on where the sanctuary was located, on the sacrificial system, uh, on the on the uh, belief in the Creator God and six days of creation, uh, um, Sabbath day, feast days, festivals, all the doctrinal systems they agreed with him on. They had all those doctrines. This was not the issue. They had the wrong God. They worship a punishing dictator, rule maker God. That is the problem. They had and, and they had that wrong God because they had the wrong understanding of law. Because at Sinai they formed the old covenant, and the old covenant is all the Lord says we will do. You've made up rules. We'll obey the rules, and our obedience will either result in our just punishment or our just rewards that we earn from you, God, by our rule keeping. Because that's how your government works. And that old covenant was dead from the moment they made it because it was never reality. That was their fantasy. But that's how they had been living the entire Old Testament. And the new covenant is the design law reality. I will write my law upon your hearts and minds. Jerem all, the, all the Bible true prophets were in the design law camp. And that's what they taught. And so this goes straight back. Yes, it's a good thing if you have the true character of God in mind, but you can only get the true character of God in mind if you come back to understand design law. If you hold that any part of God's law is imposed, that necessarily results in you worshiping a creature because the God of that law is required to use his power to punish just like creatures do. Uh, Monday's lesson, third paragraph, it says, God is sovereign and overrules events on earth for the ultimate accomplishment of his divine purpose. Although at times God alters his original plans based on our human choices, his ultimate plan for the planet will be fulfilled. There will be times when the people of God experience hardships, persecution, imprisonment, and death itself for the cause of Christ. But even in the most challenging of times with Satan's most vicious attacks, God sustains and preserves his church. Does God make things happen the way he wants them to? No. 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 No, he does not. If, if so, Eve and Adam would have never, Adam and Eve would have never sinned. So what is the balance between God's sovereignty and our freedom? Yeah, that's, that's good. Does God alter his plans because of our choices? No. Well, no. Uh, God is feeding the children of Israel manna, but they beg for meat. So what does God do? <laughs> gave him gave him quail and gave him rules on how to prepare meat uh, but that wasn't his plan no. uh, God, God's plan for Israel coming out of Egypt to occupy Canaan was for him to send the hornet and pestilence ahead and then as the land was slowly abandoned the children of Israel moved in behind them no war, no conflict just a slow gradual over several generations taking over the land what did the people do? what did they want? <laughs> they wanted war. Did God help them? Yes. God warned them not to have kings. His preference was that he would be their God and he would lead them through his prophets and, and other um, messengers. But what did the people insist upon? And what did God do? And he picked their first two. God wanted Israel to be a nation of priests to evangelize the world, but what did the nation choose? They chose to become isolationists and to reject Christ and crucify him. So what did God do? He called in new helpers to evangelize the world, to be a priesthood of believers. That's what he did. So God, is, is, God has a vision and a plan. His plan is the same because it's, uh, it's operating on design law.
just like a mother or father's love for a sick child is operating on the laws of health and doing what is ever necessary to bring that child to healing. But if the child uh, removes the bandages and takes off the antibiotic ointments and infects it with some more dirt, then the parent has to make a new plan and might have to dig in deeper and do some more debridement of the wound before and uh, might have to put some mitts on the kid's hand so he doesn't dig into it anymore. The plan is adapting, but the principles are always the same. It's always one goal, one principle, one methods being applied, um, um, but the, the specific interventions are adapting and changing because of the need. The lesson, Tuesday's lesson point, um, is about the new converts, Christians being faithful during persecution and what enabled them to be, be faithful. I have some questions I'm just gonna throw out we're not gonna answer today um, as we face the final events, because we're, we're running out of time. Final events as we face on planet Earth, what will enable us to be faithful? And my questions for y'all to think about are what does it mean to be sealed? What does it mean for probation to close? What does it mean to stand during this time without an intercessor in heaven? Does our law lens impact how we understand these ideas? Now, I'm just going to leave those with you to maybe go home this afternoon and have a conversation about. I wish you had them first. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want to close on this. I want to close on this out of Thursday's lesson. Uh, it's first sentence says, the early church uh, grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but also because they lived the gospel. Amen. Living the gospel, what does that mean? And this is the eternal gospel in Revelation 14 of the three angels' message. The angel came with the eternal gospel, which is the eternal good news that was eternally good and eternity past, not just eternity future, which meant it was still good news before earth was even created, which meant it was good news before Jesus died for our sins, which meant that Jesus dying for our sins is good news, but it's only a piece of a bigger good news. And the eternal good news is the good news that God is not like Satan made him out to be, that God is exactly the opposite of an imperial dictator rule maker. And thus those who live the good news live in harmony with our creator God, live out his principles in the way they live their life, truth presented in love, leaving people free. And Satan, is the fear monger. He is constantly sending, he's like a roaring lion and lions roars inside fear. And you see the worldwide systems constantly giving fear message to incite fear because the more fear you get, the more you're willing to cooperate with Satan's systems to enslave yourself into his system. The more fear you have, the more you're willing to cooperate with that. This is how he works to trick people to give up their own freedom and lead to their own destruction. Just look at what's happening in the world today with all the lies about climate change, which is something people cannot see, smell, touch, measure, or identify with the senses God has given them. The only way they know about it is because voices of authority are telling them that it's happening. And the voices of authority that are telling them are the godless voices who reject Jesus and reject the Bible. And because the climate change propaganda is all based on lies from the father of lies. It's the exact opposite of God's promises you'll find in Genesis 8:22, which reads, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Get your mind around, God has promised you, you do not need to fear this climate mongering garbage. It's a big giant lie that you cannot measure. It's an invisible, non-existent threat coming from voices of authority that deny God and are actually earth worshipers. They're pagan earth worshipers. Amen. And they value the earth more than they value the people. Amen. It's And their entire, their entire system is based on lies. Mm -hmm. And it's based not on just lies against the Bible, it's based on lies in science itself. Uh, if, you, if you want to see the research on that, Go to our website and type in climate change. We have a um, God's promises and climate change lies part one and two are actually document that since the burning of hydrocarbons have become more prominent in the world, the earth is becoming greener. 20% right. uh, of the earth's deserts have become habitable green zones where there is the earth has become, in other words, more earth human friendly to sustain more human life and animal life because of the burning of the hydrocarbons. Not, it's the exact opposite. And this is measured, documented, scientific, proven. So 
what is happening in the world under the spectrum of protecting climate has nothing to do with protecting climate. It has to do with inciting fear Amen. against a threat you can't see for the purposes of you willingly surrendering your freedom to the elites in charge to limit your ability to travel freely and cheaply by getting rid of gas burning vehicles and going to electric vehicles to limit your ability to provide for your family, heat your home, be autonomous and independent by shifting and requiring you to spend thousands of dollars per home on all this new gadgetry that is supposedly going to save our economy where it actually is actually making you less economically independent while shifting trillions of dollars into the coffers of the few elites who are promoting this propaganda and this false worldview. I want you to have discernment to see what's really happening in the world. The news today is it's, nothing but a fear monger. And, and exactly right. Will our church now, what you should watch for, will the church do like they did with COVID and join forces with the godless, earth-worshipping governments of the world, these leaders who are promoting this climate change garbage, to form a coalition to force such changes upon us that are contrary to God's design, kingdom, and promises. Watch for it. What's happening is incredibly destructive. And what will happen is that the system will form, and they will say, justice requires us. Now, we don't want to do this, but you guys are rebellious, and, and we it's just out of love that we need to do this. Watch for it. I just wanted to close with that thought and let you evaluate for yourself. Any questions, comments before we close? All right, let's go ahead and close. We'll do our Q&A time. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love. We thank you that you are the creator, the sustainer of this earth, including the climate, and that uh, our life is in your hands and that we trust you with the outcome. And we, and we believe your Bible promises that the seasons will continue all the way up until the very end when the earth is destroyed and ultimately replaced with a new heaven and a new earth at your hands, Lord. Help us recognize that the people on this planet are more valuable than the materials of this planet itself. And that we want to save the people because you're going to recreate the planet. Amen. Give us wisdom and discernment on how to present this, the final design law truths that will free hearts and minds back to worshiping you as our creator, redeemer, and savior. We pray in your holy name, amen. amen.